If you have your Bible, we are going to be reading in the Gospel of John, chapter 2, and reading there verses 1 through 11, the Gospel of John, chapter 2, and reading there verses 1 through 11, a very familiar passage of Scripture to you, Jesus' first miracle, changing of water into wine. You have heard me preach on this text before. I think today's message will be different than what you've heard before. And uh, I'm excited about it, and I hope you'll be excited when you hear it. So uh, God is always good and faithful to his word. John chapter 2, and beginning our reading with verse 1. On the third day a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee, Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremony and washing, each of them holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquets. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This is the first of his miraculous signs Jesus performed in Cana of Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. May God's blessing be added to the reading and the hearing of his word. It must have been a part of <laughs> Jesus is there at this wedding feast. His mother is there. Uh, she says to him, all the wine is gone. I turn myself on to that. Yeah, sorry about that. No one's in the sound room today. Thank you, Sue. You can turn me off, but only I can turn me on. <laughs> Jesus' mother is there. There's a wedding reception. It's a big party. It's a big deal. It's a huge event. And suddenly the wine is gone. Jesus' mother says to him, the wine is gone. And he says, why are you bothering me with this? Now listen to this. My time has not yet come. Nearby were six stone jars, each of them holding from 20 to 30 gallons. So if they're holding 20 gallons of water and you fill them full to the brim, which, which is what happens, that's 120 pounds worth of water, plus whatever the stone jar would weigh. If it's 30 gallons, it's 240 pounds of water, plus whatever the stone jar would weigh. I, I'm appreciative of these servants. They fill these six stone jars clear to the brim, and when they draw some of the water out, it is wine. And it is not just wine, it is the best wine. They take some to the steward of the banquet, and he tastes it and says, wait a minute. Normally people serve the best wine first, and when the palate has become numb to that, then the cheaper wine comes out, but you have saved the best for last. A very familiar passage of scripture. Cana of Galilee is up in the Galilee region. It's a little town. It's not very far from Nazareth where Jesus grew up. He'd probably been to Cana a number of times. It was a short walk from one place to the other. It is a lush subtropical region up there. Lots of grapes are grown in that area. Lots of fruits and vegetables are grown in that area. If you're probably going to live in Israel, I mean, other than the allure of living in Jerusalem, which has its own allure, you're probably going to want to live in the Galilee. Lots of fresh water, lots of fresh fruits and vegetables. It's a lovely, lovely area. It never frosts there. 
It's warm, it's delightful, it's all of those things. I want to look at this miracle today from three perspectives. The first of those is time. Jesus' response to his mother is, it is not yet my time. The miracle is what? Changing water into wine. Now, when I was a child, I heard my pastor preach on this passage of scripture, and my pastor didn't believe that anyone ought to consume alcohol in any fashion or form. And so his sermon dealt with Jesus changing water into grape juice. <clears throat> now, I want to tell you, if Jesus changed water into grape juice, it would be a miracle. But it's a miracle that might be replicated in some way. You could supposedly have some grape concentrated powder hidden up your sleeve and wave your hands over there and drop that powder in their Kool-Aid. You, you know, if you're my age, you remember Kool-Aid, right, John? <laughs> You could fake changing water into grape juice, but you cannot fake changing water into wine because wine requires a fermentation period of time. I'm not sure how long it takes for, for, for wine to ferment, but it takes some period of time. I want you to understand that the first thing that Jesus demonstrates in this first miracle is that he is timeless. Time is not of consequence to him. You and I are driven by time. We start worship at 10 o'clock. We, you know, have doctor's appointments and we need to be there at such and so a time. Sometimes it'd be nice for them to be on time, but, you know, that's my little commentary. We eat when it's a certain time. We go to work when it's a certain time. We go to bed when it's a certain time. We wake up when it's a certain time. Don't you love those days when you can sleep in and invariably don't you wake up before you really wanted to? We are so time driven and Jesus eliminates time. He is timeless. His majesty is timeless. God is eternal. There is no such thing for God as yesterday, and there is no such thing for God as tomorrow. He is always eternally present now. Jesus says in the burning bush when he speaks to Moses, he says, I am who I am. He does not ever say, I was or I will be. It is the eternal presence of now. Jesus changes water into wine immediately. He bypasses the need for a time. That's the first aspect of this miracle that I want you to see. So they fill these jars of water, uh, with water, and they draw some out, and it is good wine. I want you to understand that when Jesus changes something, including you, he changes you completely. He doesn't have half of it be wine and half of it be water. He changes it completely. At the moment when we trust Jesus to be our Savior and our Lord, he indwells us with his Holy Spirit, and we are changed completely and fully at that moment. That doesn't mean that we can't learn more about who the Lord is after our salvation experience. We should. We should be walking closer to the Lord today than when we ask Jesus to be our Savior. We should be continually improving our understanding and our relationship with the Lord. But when he changes us, he changes us completely. I'm impressed in this, the miracle stories of Scripture, both Old and New Testaments. Remember the story of Naaman. Naaman was an, an officer in the Babylonian army, and he gets leprosy. And he finally comes to the prophet of God and says, 
you know, what must I do to get rid of this leprosy? And he's told to go down to the Jordan River and he's to dip seven times in the Jordan River. And he could have said, listen, in Babylon, we have much more beautiful rivers than the Jordan. The Jordan is not as big as the Yellow Breaches Creek for the most part. And it runs muddy about 50% of the time. Well, I just go back to one of the rivers in Babylon, one of the rivers, the Tigris or the Euphrates there. And I don't I dip in that water, but that's not what God had spoken to the prophet. It was to go to the Jordan River and to dip not five times, not six times, but seven times. He wants to see if we're going to be obedient. God could have changed him on that first moment of dipping into the water, but that's not what God chose to do. He wants to put him to the test and find out whether he is worthy. Well, friends, I want to tell you that you and I are not worthy. The scripture tells us that we are born into sin. Sin is the predominant issue of our life until such time when the Holy Spirit indwells us at the moment of our salvation. And when he does, he changes us completely. There are not a lot of people who have been baptized in the Yellow Breaches Creek. And some of them, it was a life-changing moment. And I'm sorry to say, for a few of them, they simply got wet. Naaman goes down to the Jordan River and he dips five times, six times, and he still has leprosy. And he could have just quit right then and said, that's it. God is not going to heal this in me. But he is obedient and God is faithful. When he dips the seventh time, he is healed. So God has no aspect of time. And when he changes the water into wine, he changes it completely. There are six jars. All of them are changed into wine. He doesn't change one of them and leave the other five water. He doesn't change two and leave four, three, and three, so on. He changes them completely. God has a desire to change you completely. That sin is no longer the predominant issue of your life, but grace and peace and mercy become the predominant issue of your life. Salvation from God becomes the predominant issue of your life. The third thing that I want you to see in this miracle today is that when he changes you, it is for the best. When Jesus changes the water into wine and they takes them out to the steward, he knows it is the best. God changes you and me for the best. He doesn't change us to be mediocre. On one occasion, Jesus says, lukewarm water you spit out of your mouth. When you're going to drink water, you want it to be hot or you want it to be cold. He wants us to be the best. Now, not necessarily in comparison to somebody else. That's not our issue. That should never be our issue. We shouldn't be comparing ourselves. I, I'm a better Christian than you are. Well, I think that's a bit of a problem. I think there's some pride stuff that happens in that situation. I'm tired of the preachers on TV who flaunt their $70 million jet airplanes because look what the Lord has done for me. <laughs> it's not about that. God changes us to be the best for service in his kingdom. To the, be the best that we can be for his purpose. Not in comparison to somebody else. But only in comparison to what we used to be. Once I was blind, now I can see. 
Once I was dead in my sins and transgressions, now I have been set free by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He changes us to be the best. When I was a freshman in high school, I had a teacher who was supposedly teaching us general science. But the first thing that we learned in our general science class was a poem. In fact, we had our first test on the poem. And the poem went like this, good, better, best, never let it rest. Until your good is better, and your better, best. That's what our general science teacher wanted of us. He wanted us to be our best. He wanted us to work hard to be our best. That's what God wants of us. He wants us to be the best. Jesus didn't change the water into to wine for it to be ripple. He changed the water into wine for it to be the best. I don't even know what the best is, but I'll say Chablis. That could be it. I'm not sure. I'm not much of a wine connoisseur. But this I know. He wants us to be the best. And that's his expectation of us. So he demonstrates in this miracle the fact that he's timeless. Time holds no mastery over Jesus. He instantly and immediately changes the water into wine, regardless of the fact that wine takes fermentation time. The second thing I want you to see is that he changes this water into wine completely. All six jars are changed into wine. And he changes us completely. He doesn't save 90% of us and then say, well, go ahead and figure out what to do with the other 10% of your life. No, he changes us completely. And he changes us for the third thing, for the best. He changes us for the best. I believe that if each of us can grasp this miracle, for understand it for what it is, that it will have a significant impact upon our life from an individual perspective, as well as from the corporate perspective of the church. He wants us. He changes us, and he changes us for the best. What kind of a difference can that make in your life? I don't know what the water was like beforehand, but I know for the most part, in Israel, in Jesus' day, water was not good. People didn't drink water because it wasn't good. It was contaminated. Today, we'd probably have all different kinds of scientific tests we could do with that water to tell you whether it has coliform contamination, whether it's E. coli contaminated or whatever it might be. But when Jesus changed the water, it became the best. I was a kid growing up in a Christian home. Mom and dad were Christians long before my brothers or I were born into the family. They were not perfect. But they were believers. I was the third and final child in my family. 
My older two siblings are identical twins. They were perfect. <laughs> At least in their eyes. And I was less than perfect. You know, being the youngest kid, you, 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 you put up with a lot. And I can share with you stories from now till Jesus comes about that, but that's not the purpose of today. And I had my own issues to deal with, including my inability to speak. When I was in elementary school, I couldn't say two words in a row without stuttering over the second word. And my nickname was Stutter Boy. And I hated it, as I'm sure you can imagine. But then came the day. And the day for me was on June 9th, 1969, when I asked Jesus to be my Savior and my Lord. And he changed me instantly and immediately. And he touched my lips. And beginning on June 9th, 1969, until this day, stuttering is not my issue any longer. I think it would be very difficult to be a pastor if stuttering were your issue. <coughs> Instead of a 15-minute sermon, it might be a 45-minute sermon to say the same thing. It's horrible to be a stutterer. But God touched my lips. He changed me immediately. He changed me completely. And he changed me for the best. Not that I'm the best at anything. But he changed me so that I could do his work and his will. And here's what I want you to know. Jesus is still in the business of changing lives. Yours and mine and all of us. Sometime later, the people demand of Jesus a sign. Here's your sign. Why do we doubt? Here's your sign. Pray with me. Father God, we thank you this day for who you are, for the wonderful power of change that you bring into our lives at the moment of our salvation, that you change us completely and wholly, and you change us for the better. Oh Lord, we're so grateful this day. We ask now, oh Lord, that as we gather at your table, that we might come in reverence to you, in obedience to your command and with a desire to follow you even more closely. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul writes these words to us. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying to them, This is my body. Eat this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup and gave it to them, saying, This is the blood of a new covenant. Drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I want to say just one word about that last phrase. 
The meal that we are going to have here, this piece of bread and this glass of grape juice, is a reflection of the past and an anticipation of the future. In the Jewish Passover meal, from where this comes, it is always consumed, and at the last thing, the benediction, if you will, was this year in Bowmansdale, next year in Jerusalem. And so for us, Jesus says, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And he also shares with us, until he comes. So we look to the past, we live in the present, and we anticipate the future when Jesus comes. We invite any and all who profess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord to join with us as we gather at the table. The ushers will distribute the elements to you. I would ask that you would hold them and we will partake together. Would the ushers please come? you for the gift of this bread and this cup for it reminds us of who Jesus is and gives us hope for what is to come in Jesus we pray amen take and eat the new covenant, drink it in remembrance of him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your son who changes us. Amen.